Hello, I'm Joel Burdick. I did work with Richard for about a decade, but starting about 12 years ago, I started working on spinal cord injury. The whole way in which we interact with the physical world is modulated by our spinal cord. And um, it's not just a dumb pipe. Its precise structure allows you individual precise control of muscles so that you can play sports or the beautiful music that you heard earlier today. But as more than a million people in the US know, when there's an injury uh, to those pathways in the spinal cord, a paralysis or loss of function can result. And about half a million people in the US have severe paralysis, which constricts them to be in a wheelchair. And I'm interested in the most uh, severe cases called motor complete, which are about half of those patients um, who actually have no motor function whatsoever below the level of their, of their injury. So unless you know someone with spinal cord injury, uh, you'll be surprised to hear that when the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation five years ago surveyed a broad spectrum of spinal patients and asked them, if you could have back five things that you lost from your injury, what would they be? Locomotion was not top five. Um, because the damage to the autonomic nervous system leaves these patients with daily troubles. For example, many pa uh, patients have to use catheters to manage their bladder. Spinal patients die at a rate 11 times the general population uh, from bladder complications. Also, most spinal cord patients have to spend up to about an hour per day extra compared to you and I managing their bowel. Um, the damage to the blood control system also uh, leads them to great spikes in blood pressure, uh, which is life-threatening and leads to emergency room visits, uh, but also drops in pressure, which leaves them in the lethargic fog. And so it's the totality of all these secondary issues uh, which these patients struggle with every day uh, and also leads them to have an extra $2 million in health expenses over their lifetime, uh, which is typically 40 years with spinal cord injury. Oh, I forgot to mention, sex was top five. So now, there are groups around the country uh, trying to uh, deal with this problem. And so people are developing new techniques to uh, relieve the pressure uh, uh, during an injury uh, to get the best survival possible after a severe injury. Uh, and in order to regrow new connections, a variety of teams are using stem cells, um, neural tissue transplantation, or changing the genetic regulatory mechanisms of neural regrowth uh, to sprout new connections. Now, all of these are the right long-term solution, but we don't know when that long-term is yet. And unfortunately, for the complete uh, injured subjects today, really the only therapy are uh, to give them drugs to manage the side effects we just talked about, and also to provide them with occupational therapy to live with their new life situation. So our team has been taking um, another approach, which is based on the concept of a central pattern generator. So uh, today, when you get up from your chair and walk out and are talking to a colleague, or tonight at a cocktail party when you're standing talking with your friends, um, your brain is actually not much involved in your movements. In fact, down in the lower part of your spinal cord, uh, there's circuitry called the central pattern generator, which takes the high-level input from the brain as to the high-level commands, and then coordinates the input from the muscles and figures out what are the instant-by-instant -instant muscle commands necessary to carry out those high-level instructions. Now, after a major spinal cord injury, um, that system is gone, but uh, what we have figured out how to do is to tap into that system and to sort of spoof it into thinking that it's actually at a cocktail party uh, or walking down the hallway. And the way they do that is actually by placing electrodes in the epidural space between the inside of the vertebra and the dura over that locomotion circuitry in the lower spinal cord. And so, like Richard, we first started out working with animals. So our Russian colleague first taught us um, that by placing two wires uh, over the lumbosacral circuitry, um, this is a rat whose spinal cord has been completely disconnected from its brain. Uh, and one week after that injury, it's actually able to walk by using the stimulation. Even more surprising, considering that the brain is disconnected, when you reverse the treadmill, this animal can actually walk backward. The brain's not involved in doing this movement. And it can even walk sideways. So now, being a simple-minded engineer, uh, the first thing I thought of was, well, if two wires are good, 27 electrodes has to be better. Uh, <laughs> and so with Yu Chang Tai, we developed what you see in the lower left there, uh, thousands of an inch thick uh, electrodes that we can place on the spine um, so that actually the complex spatial temporal patterns allow us to provide better locomotion than we could do with the wires. Here's comparison side by side. But also preferentially excite standing versus sort of walking. And we could also uh, preferentially drive the animal one way or the other. Here you see on the right-hand side the animal being steered towards the right. So now we have the question, will this work in a human? And so, unfortunately, our technology is not ready for humans, and we didn't know if it would work because do humans have the same uh, spinal anatomy as rats? And so, fortunately, there's a technology out there used for back pain relief in which electrodes are implanted in the spinal cord, in the epidural space that we want to use. And 
We can then attach them to a battery pack, which provides uh, sort of small pulses. And we can adjust the frequency and pacing of those pulses um, so that we can relieve pain at high frequency. But by putting it over the lumbosacral spinal cord and using low frequency, um, we can actually uh, potentially excite that circuitry and excite that cocktail party effect. Our first subject was actually a remarkable human being named Rob Summers, who was a Division I NCAA national champion pitcher before he was tragically hit by a car. And um, so we actually, uh, after three years after his injury, he uh, agreed to be a volunteer for our first subject, for our first surgery. And so we trained him every day for a year before the surgery just to see if we could actually get any function back whatsoever. We found out he was truly paralyzed. And so uh, we implanted the electrodes, and two weeks after the scars healed, uh, we checked them out, and so the first day we said, well, Rob, let's see what you can do. And as you can see on the upper left there, he stood up the first day. Um, and so um, this was surprising to us because we thought this would take five years, and now we're like, oh crap, what do we do? Um, <laughs> and so we continue to train him every day, and so what you see here um, is one of his training sessions. So the therapist helped him stand up initially. He can do it on his own now, and the therapist there on the right is actually jack jacking up the voltage, and he gives a little wiggle which says, okay, I'm ready to go, and so he can sort of step independently. Now, an amazing thing happened as we sort of continue to train him every day. Um, he started to recover bladder function after about five months. He eventually regulated his blood pressure so he was off all his medications. He regained bowel control after that. And the most amazing thing happened actually about a year, uh, excuse me, eight months after his surgery. One day he was sort of playing a joke uh, with Susan Harkema and said, Susie, look, I'm gonna move my toe. He didn't expect to do it, uh, and he actually did. And so if you can hear, turn the volume up a little bit. You can actually hear and see him actually moving his legs leg uh, in coordination down. then uh, with the sort of verbal command. Left leg up. And so just a few weeks later after this, uh, during Left. a routine treadmill training, we actually reached the point where now um, he could sort of independently uh, make sort of voluntary steps along the treadmill uh, during his training process. So um, this is where Rob is today. Um, we've actually uh, continued this work and we've now actually um, uh, implanted two other patients who both stood up on the first day, uh, who both recovered voluntary control. And so for example, um, this is our third patient um, moving his legs voluntarily uh, just about four months after implantation. So um, let me conclude um, that none of our team, uh, which is a large team, believes this is actually a cure. It's just a therapy um, to help these patients manage their health and have healthier lives. And so we've just implanted a fourth subject on Monday. Uh, we've now actually have implanted a human for upper body paralysis with positive results, and we're now preparing studies to see if this can help the 300,000 people per year with motor damage due to stroke. Thank you. <laughs>